Angel Nieves is a former NYPD detective and says... The late photographer, journalist Ardina Seward. Nice to see you, Ardina. Thanks for having me, guys. Welcome, everybody, and here we go again for another episode of Your Pet Detective. I am Ardina Sur, and that guy over there is retired NYPD detective and founder of the show Angel Nieves. We are, I want to say we're live, but we're recording live, but when you see it, it will have been recorded already, but we are sitting here in a uh, in a very heated New York City. It's, it's, it's ultra heat, and it is hot, hot, hot. But we have some hot topics tonight, and this involves pet finding. Now, Angel himself is a pet detective. And I was curious about this show because Angel, if, if, Angel was an NYPD detective. So in, when Angel helps people to find their lost pets, Angel employs the techniques that he learned as a longtime detective for NYPD, the traditional method of finding pets. Right. The critical analysis, the logic, you know, where to want, you, you follow a number of steps. But the guest we have tonight is also a pet detective of sorts, but he uses something that's totally, totally different. His technique is an intuitive clairvoyant technique, and he has had some successes. His name is Jim Tierney. Angel has some tape that he has labored over and edited, which he does every week. I want to give him a round of applause. Angel, show the audience what you've done. And there you have it. Um, I I, I uh, did not mention your specific title at the beginning of the show. I think I screwed it up because I said uh, um, you, that you work by, by tuition. But you are an intuitive walker. Term I have never heard of before. And I don't think Angel has either. <laughs> so what I... I just scratched my head. What's the difference between a clairvoyant and an intuitive walker? Educate uh yeah, so the so it's it's the same. Uh, the intuitive walker. The reason why I came up with that name is, for about six years, I ran a dog walking service in Brooklyn, okay. and I was, you know, obsessed with being around dogs constantly for you know six years. And then I started getting into volunteering, and then I started getting into this. So I always found out the two things that I did was I am intuitive and I walk a lot. So I called myself the intuitive walker. Okay. Um, what I use is it is clairvoyance. It's a form of clairvoyance. Uh, I use impressions, but I also don't only use those. I actually just use those. I let them come into the case as I see different things, um, but I actually don't. Uh, I don't lead with them only because uh, I, I need them to prove that they're actually valid, just as much as someone's phone call that a dog is, you know, somewhere. So that's kind of how I operate. Okay, you know, I, I'm kind of in the middle, and you guys are on both sides of the screen, and although you are both pet de detectives. I um, mean, what's intriguing is that the the end result is the same, but the approaches are very, very different. Uh, I mentioned earlier that Angel is classically trained as a detective in finding uh, in, in finding pets. Well, you, on the other hand, well, you you tell us how did you arrive at your ability to find lost pets? Uh, well, for the the physical, do you want the physical story or do you want the intuitive version? I mean, you know, I have, I came to both of them at two different times and, and when I decided to incorporate the both of them, but, um, 
Does, does it matter? Yeah, well, I, I, I think I think what the audience may be interested in is uh, a lot of people are clairvoyant. We mm -hmm. all have intuition, which some of us act upon and some of us do not. So at what point did you say my intuition can be applied to lost pets? Got it. Okay, yeah. So it was a dog that I was helping with that ran onto the BQE on a Friday night. The dad was so afraid that he didn't want to go up there. He didn't know if he was going to find the body of the dog. And I went up there. We found out that the dog kept running down to exit one up to the Brooklyn Bridge. And I saw the dog running on 17th Street at the uh, or the 15th Street entrance going down uh, Prospect Park West. And I told my friend, that's where I see this dog running into. And she says, oh, that's interesting. So I went out there and I started to wait for the dog for three days and I got nothing. But on the fourth morning, that's where he was found. So I was very interested in the idea that I'm getting these impressions and I didn't know how to apply them because I knew that they, they weren't necessarily GPS systems or timestamps. I could be seeing something that's going to happen. I could be some, see something that did happen. And so I started to play around with that a lot and use that in whenever I went out and, uh, and looked for dogs. Now, what I usually do is if I really don't really dial into the intuition uh, until... I feel like we're, we're not left with anything. We have no clue where this dog is. And that's when, uh, you know, a couple of people will remind me, well, why don't you just draw something and see what you get? And then what I try and do is I, I get the impressions and then I'll look around areas with landmarks that are similar to the drawing or that feel similar to the drawing. And then I'll actually start focusing in those areas uh, with trail cameras or I'll do it with, um, we just will highly, we'll, we'll put a lot of posters in that area. Um, and it, and it has worked. It does work. It's just that it's, um, it's not always the easiest thing to read. It, in other words, there was a, I think the one that, um, I don't know if you got to show that one, but there was one in Newark airport and I got an impression very specifically that there was a, that the dog was going to be on an off ramp. Uh, and I drew it and I showed my brother. Oh, so I was looking for these off ramps and I couldn't, now the dog was found and captured under an off ramp. But it wasn't an off ramp until we knew that there was a sighting. And then I realized, oh, this is the off ramp I kept seeing. And I took a picture in comparison. So how do you use psychic ability to bring it into helping in the physical? And I think that it's just really difficult um, to know how to read some, some of the signs in the language. But I do use it. And I do use it sometimes for people in California. I had people in Australia that contacted me once. So I do do drawings for them. And just show them this is the area. And what I do is I never say, I don't, I, I basically say, I don't want to know anything about your animal. And I don't even want to know your address. I want to know nothing. Let me just do the reading from the picture. And then from that, I'll have them send me their address after they have all the data. And then together we look at all the maps. And half the time they already know the things I'm talking about. Um, I never came across someone who didn't know what this was. So I kind of think that's kind of cool. You know, the, the, uh, I got I got to ask the um, I got to play devil's advocate here, because there's a lot of skepticism about mm -hmm. psychics, clairvoyance in general, and for the psychics that kind of scam it, they uh, they're able to use certain techniques, generalizations, um, uh, foreknowledge, whatever, to be able to say that they are psychic and they are able to find an animal, find a missing person. But then again, I, I got to admit, at police, Angel, you may remember that uh, there were certain cases that were real tough cases for NYPD, and the cops called in a psychic. One of them was Dorothy Allison. And Dorothy Allison had a success rate, I would say, of 90%. She was the real deal. So well, what the separates people, you? Some, um, of the people, some of the people that we actually spoke to in our shows did work with detectives and cops. Did work with detectives. So there you go. So I think the question is, what separates you from the fakes? Well, that's just it. I mean, you, yeah, like that's where I think, how could I, I don't know how I can show somebody where their dog is or, or draw what I'm seeing if I don't even know where they're from or where their dog is. That, is, that to me is some sort of, that's for, the, for that. But it's actually easier for me to read an animal anything from an animal knowing nothing. I mean, that's the easiest thing ever because no matter what you get, you realize that's the thing you're getting. 
you're not doing anything. You're not leaning towards anything because there's nothing to lean towards. You have no information. So uh, sorry about that. <laughs> so yeah, so I think the, um, for me, that's like, that's what I think helps the people. And I say, this is, this doesn't mean that, you know, your, your dog is literally like going to be at that store at this time, but it means that your dog might've passed that store or it might've passed that structure, or it might be hanging around that structure for the last week. And from there, that's what we work with. And I think um, a lot of times, sometimes people will be really trusting of my information. And I'm the one that's saying, listen, like, let's not put all our eggs in this one basket just because it's just an impression. You got to know what, you you know, I'm not going to just abandon everything when I know I don't know what's up yet. You know what I'm saying? So I, I always like to balance it with uh, starting every case with practical steps, because a lot of times you can find the dog practically, you know, if it's, you know. Now, when, when you, when you um, intuit are you getting your messages directly from the animal or are you getting your messages from, from another? Yeah. I, so I think for me, it's um, when I started to do this and it was with people, you know, doing readings for people and stuff. Uh, I was getting, I was really nervous with this guy. I studied with a, a psychic medium and he said, you know, just sit down and, and, and relax. And he realized what I, what, what I, my process and he trusted my process. He started bringing random people in. And one of the things that really helped me was because I hear these people were just staring at me. I had no idea. I was nervous. And then I realized it's always good to start with what, what's already there. There's already something in my head that's already arrived that I didn't even catch yet. And then I go to that place and that's where I start. It happens immediately. So, you know what I mean? So here's an example. I think I said this on the last interview that I had, but it, it's a very powerful example. I had somebody that said, I want you to tell me something about a friend that had passed uh, and I said, well, just don't tell me any information. And he said, okay, but why? And I said, because let me give you an example. I said, if, if you're going to, if all of a sudden uh, you say my friend was a golfer and that, he, and then he said, my friend was a professional golfer. And that's what shocked us because I was, what I was doing was using what was already in my head and it was all imagery, but I was picking it up already from what this guy was even talking about. Just, just the idea that his friend, you know, who this guy was and his friend. I just picked up that stuff and just gave it to him without even knowing it. I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot for a second before I before I I, uh, I, I yield to to Angel. Um, there was a pet that passed away recently in my family. I'm not going to tell you what kind of pet it was. Uh, I mean, I don't know if that's even fair in the analysis. You got you got to work with something. But it was it was a very it, it was a, a very beloved pet, and. Um, I don't know. Are you getting any messages in regards to that pet? Are you picking up anything? Uh, all I see, is, all I'm seeing is a white cat. That's it. That's interesting because it was a cat. It was not a white cat. I, well, so that's it. I, I'm just going off of what the image. As you're talking, I'm already seeing a cat walking by. So, so that's kind of how it works for me. Well, you know something? I tell you, uh, you didn't say it was a turtle. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. It was, you it should was, have said it was like a, it was a dolphin or something, and we. <laughs> no, but I, that's all right. That it was indeed it was a cat, and it wasn't it wasn't a white cat. It was just the opposite. It was a black cat, but indeed it was a cat. All right. So with that, Angel, I'm going to yield to you. <laughs> I know so, you're laughing. Are you laughing? It was it was a test. It was a true story. Angel knows the information, but. It's, it's a good. It's, it's, a, it's, it's good. I mean, it, at least it, you you told him you're not going to tell what kind of animal it is. So right, I would tell what kind of I mean, it could so have been a bird. Out, so it came out to his mind as cat. He didn't say, "I'm not going to tell you the color of the cat." You know what I mean? Right. So he went for what you asked him. Right. You asked him for the cat. But I, 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 I read some more about you. Of course, that's what I do. And um, I actually saw was that you actually dream of these spots too. It's not only it yeah. comes to your mind. You dream, and then you write on your dream. Yeah, it is. And, and, yeah. Thing, and the, the way it is, like, I lost my dog. Okay, you see the picture of the dog. Okay, so I lost the dog. You dream it. You draw the area. A couple of days later, it was found in that area. So in other words, you're proving yourself what you're doing is true. It's not only me saying, well, it could be in this dark alley. Like, there's a lot of dark alley in this world. And I see a bum walking, which is a lot of bums in the world. So you actually come out to a specific place. Yeah. Well, I always ask for whether it's 
whether I'm doing a drawing or I'm doing, or if I get a dream, I'm always, uh, I'm at a very specific place. And I'm all, and I, I drew, the, I think the one you're referring to, there was one, there was a case with a dog that was missing and I, I dreamt of a courtyard. And I remember the courtyard very specifically and I drew it. And I, and I drew, this is weird, it was houses and it felt like it was the city. And then when that dog was found the next day, it was in a courtyard and I compared the two. And then some people can be like, wow, that's, that's weird. Or some people are, that's not a big deal. Or, you know, it depends on what the person really sees or feels. Um, well, some, people, they, some people go against it and it's oh, yeah. try, they'll try themselves to find a reason yeah. to go against you that actually say reality, it really happened. Yeah. And okay. I, I don't even go to the spiritual thing of it all. To me, I think it's just basically, I, from what I've read on quantum, quantum physics and, you know, biocentrism i think there's quantum entanglement i think there's i think there's a way that people can actually dial into a field that gives us all this information i don't think you have to be some sort of pope or you know guru or anything like that it's just people can do it so, um so this is what we... with, with, uh, uh, just uh, an angel just let me make this point there was a great movie called uh what the bleep do we know oh, yeah i saw that that and that movie, Angel. I don't know if you saw that, but it is. It's. It's. I tell you, it's a must watch, because it's about the, the the the. It's about the the, the physics of intuition. It's very. But it's a kind of documentary that you've got to watch three or four times to really be able to get what they're saying. And even then, you won't understand all of what they're saying. But but yeah. to the point, you know, I wanted to make that, and I I, I cut you off. I, I didn't want to I didn't want to no. lose that that thought. But go ahead, Angel. You, you were saying something. All right, so one of the, this is one of your spots. Yeah what yeah yeah. Story here. What's the story there? Yeah. Yeah. So that spot, I forgot what dog this was for. Um, I think this was. Oh, uh, this was a spot in. I believe this is a spot in California. If I'm not mistaken, but anyway, yeah, I, I drew a structure. I drew a structure of something, and I don't know what that is. But then, yes, I'll I'll look on the map and I'll find a sort of uh, something that just registers that it could be something similar, whether it be the height. Um, but you can see like the little the little roof on top um, that spoke to me a little bit. But also um, movement. You know, a lot of times when I get stuff in parks, it's strange stuff that looks like. There's supposed to be movement, but people are supposed to be experiencing fun, you know. Um, so I kind of that's where that's how I got to that, I believe. Um, but that was that wasn't far from, I believe, where the dog was. The, the dog, the, the dog that I was looking for, if this is the one I'm thinking of, was in California. And I did it remotely on drawings. And um, across the street was a, a building that looked like a postal service building that was being built. And that's what I drew. And then I showed the mother. She had no response to it, didn't really care. She didn't really respond to any of it. Um, and then the dog was found, I think, two days later, about two miles away on the same street. So, and here, and here's another one. That's the one I'm talking about. Yeah, this is the one in California. Yeah, exactly. So this woman's dog was missing in Los Angeles in, a, in an area. like, But she had no idea. It could have been at the beach. We're talking miles. And I drew that, and that happened to be on the same street as where the dog went missing, but about a mile away. And then a mile north of that is where the dog was eventually found. What's the, the furthest uh, distance that you have been able to intuit where an animal was missing? I know you said that you intuit remotely. So what's the furthest distance that where you, you had a vision of where a particular animal... Was, Australia was the one. I spoke to a guy from Australia. They had a police dog that was missing. His name was Quiz. And uh, I don't believe they ever found Quiz, but they, they had five psychics. They, he didn't tell me this. But we, he had me do a reading, and I, and I drew and everything, and I told him that his dog was on a hill by water, but also the, the, the right hind leg was injured. And he asked me where I got that, and he said, every one of you have said the same thing. So I thought that was pretty interesting, you know, that we were all dialing into the same thing. But that, that was in Australia. Bring something to, to mind, and I, I think uh, probably the two of you have, have read about that phenomenal rescue of the three children in the Amazon, Amazon jungle 
about a month ago. It was uh, it's a story that the movie's probably already being made. Anyway, to make a long story short, there were three children who were traveling with their mother to visit their dad uh, from literally from the Amazon jungle to a a part of I think it was either Colombia or or Ecuador, Columbia. Well, Colombia, where their father was, and the plane went down in the jungle. The mother was killed. The pilot was killed. But the kids were able to survive. But the children raised in age from what was it, uh, 12 to I think one year one year old. The point the point to be made here is that the Colombian military became involved, and they had a dog, and the dog went into the jungle looking for the children. Mm -hmm. And there is evidence that the dog did find the children, but the dog got separated from the Colum from from the owners, which were the Colombian military. The dog stayed with the kids for, I mean, the kids were lost for a, 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 a weeks, but the dog stayed with the kids. And then the dog disappeared in the jungle just before the kids were found. Hmm. And the Colombian military is saying, unfortunately, the dog was probably lost. But reading that story, it it was it's a tearjerker to begin with because you got you know kids surviving on not only their 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 wits but their uh, their jungle skills that they their indigenous jungle skills which they had learned from their their mom and their grandmother they survived off of plants. But then you add add to the fact that you have this dog who intuitively stayed with those children. The dog was separated from his owners. And the, the tragedy was, yes, that the mother was killed, but the other tragedy is that that dog was lost. And I had the feeling somehow, I'm not, I, I, I wouldn't consider myself nearly as, as intuitive as you are, but I had the feeling it's, that that dog is still alive. That dog somewhere in that jungle is still alive. And I wish that somebody could find that dog because the dog is such an important part of that story. So there you go. There's your challenge, Jim. Find that dog. Right. Yeah, of course. No problem. <laughs> it's a huge story. I mean, it's a huge... It be, the story became an international story. Every publication covered, you know, from, from Timbuktu to uh, to the Bronx. That, so, sounds, but, that yeah. sounds like a Rambo movie, part 10. Yeah. It, it was just fascinating, but the dog was such an important part yeah. Of that story and to find that dog, if if you could find that dog, I mean that would be such a score. You know, not only. Oh yeah, I mean, I... psychologically, the kids the, the kids were asking for that dog, and the dog is part of the healing of those children. So they lost their mother, but to lose the dog is like a double whammy. Find that dog. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> there's this this they this, have to want to have they have to want to have help, you know. The military, you got, let, let's speak, the Colombian military isn't going to advertise for, for, for a, a, a psychic pet detective. Exactly, and they probably but, have somebody over there doing that. I mean, let me tell you, if you have some ideas, you come right back on this show. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I only, yeah, I think, I think the one in Australia was heartbreaking because I asked the guy, you know, what was the, what was the environment like? And he said, there's everything in the, everything from kangaroo to uh, different types of like wild dogs. And he, and he essentially said that most likely would be dead. It wouldn't, it wouldn't survive. And it was a German shepherd. Um, but who knows? I mean, I don't know. I, I, I saw the dog injured, but you know, maybe that dog made it out somewhere through, you know, a truck driver could have picked that dog up. I, you just don't know. How, well, you know, how, let me ask you this. I mean, cause I'm so, I'm so intrigued with that, with that dog who had a kind of psychic sense in itself, knowing that it had to stay with the children. Uh, how, how difficult would it be for a dog to survive in that environment? Well, dogs, are, they survive longer. A lot of people, myself included, when, uh, when, especially when there was, um, there was a dog missing in Brooklyn and there was a snowstorm coming. And it was like, it was 14 inches of snow coming. This dog had been out already for two weeks and had no coat and... I was like, this dog's going to freeze to death. I mean, how, uh, how, how is he going to survive this? And I was, and I found out, no, that's not true. And if you look it up, there's certain breeds that have ways of, of actually manipulating blood flow to different parts of their body based on their breed. 
So they're surviving way better than we are. Uh, we would be dead. I, I certainly wouldn't be able to survive something like that. But dogs are not babies. You know, they're not they're not they know how to get in there and just start to make sure their needs are met. And so I never worry about a dog, even the little dog, Frankie, in Brooklyn. We were looking for that guy for 28 days. And one of the nights we found one of the nights we were looking for him, it was six degrees. I think the night we found him, it was like 10 degrees. It was freezing. And that dog was alive with no coat on. <laughs> Do you ever get, would you ever get a message from a lost pet that it does not want to go back to its original owner? I've never had that experience, no. And a lot, well, this, and also a lot of the, the dogs I, I work with, majority of them are actually rescues and transit or rescues that have just been given to a, a, a person who didn't understand the skittish, the level of skittishness. And so uh, I don't, you know, I'll do, I do pets, but most of the time it's, um, uh, like rescue groups that'll contact me to see if I can help them get a dog back. Um, or a desperate, like right now, there's there's one guy who's looking for his dog. He was in Germany, and now he's flying back tonight because he's trying to get his dog back. And wow. it's you know, so I do work with with pet owners as well, and that's really distressing because you know, if if you don't get the the dog in like three days, all of a sudden they think this guy doesn't know what he's doing. They just don't realize how difficult it is to to do something like this. Like. In New Jersey, there was a dog running across the New Jersey Turnpike, and it was, and it made it alive back and forth a, a couple of times. And the state troopers were like, "This this dog's going to cause a major car accident." And it went into about seventy to seventy five locations within two weeks. Seventy five locations. It was all over the place. It, it wouldn't stop moving, and you couldn't go near it. And eventually, I had to under. I said, "You know, there's a there's a creek that goes here, and I bet you that's where he's following because there's a water source." So I put something back there and there was nothing the first night. And I said, okay, let me get the trap out of there. But I left the camera and I said, no, I didn't leave the camera. That's what it is. I got the trap and the camera out of there saying, oh, this is a wash. But I left the chicken. There was a whole chicken that I left. But I left it for a fox that wanted to go in my trap but wouldn't go in. So I said, let me just leave him some chicken. And then I thought about it and I said, you should have left the camera there. So when I went back there to put the camera, I saw the dog running away with the chicken in its mouth. And that's how I got the dog. You know, I, I got eventually. But it, if I didn't have that sort of like, like I felt like that dog would be doing that. Like that, those are the kinds of little things that I, I work with. But I don't sit there and declare to the owners. I, half the time, I don't even tell the owners. No, 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 you told about that. Let's go to the second part. We have another talent. Okay. The talent is um, your, your experience in trapping dogs and finding them. Yeah. It's more, it's more than intuitive. Is also how you get these dogs. You already know the spot where you're at. Now is to get the dog. Yeah. Okay? That, yeah. It's not gonna go with mine to mine with the dog come back to me. <clears throat> not gonna work. So you have yeah. to do a lot of traps. I mean, what do you actually do? How's your setup? So I start out usually with I, I need to get all the details as far as who what kind of dog it was, how long was the person bonded to this dog? Did you move recently? Are you close to home or is it displaced? Um, I wanna know. All the sightings you got, whether you think they're valid or not, I need to know the times and the days. Uh, what shape was the dog in? What direction was it moving in? I get all of that, and I kind of, I come to, to to an idea of like the patterns. I start to follow the patterns. Is he following the creek, the brook? What do these three locations have in common? Find the common thing about all those three locations, and you'll most likely find out what he's doing and why he's there. Is he getting food from a feeding station from cats? Is it the garbage night? You go, that's, it's a lot of stuff that you got to think about. Um, one, and, and the one in Newark airport was brutal because all I was given was um, that this dog was, came off the plane from Puerto Rico, ran down the tarmac, the workers chased after him and it ran onto the New Jersey turnpike in the brush, no tag, no collar, no, um, t no chip. And this is the best part. There's no people down there. There's only people traveling. And you weren't even allowed to put posters up. So I was stuck with this case. And I was like, this is nuts. Why would I even take this case? <laughs> and, it, and eventually it, it came together, you know, and I got him back. But, but it took a while. And, it, and it, it, it's persistence, too. I mean, I slept in a car for three nights. What's your things. success rate? How many have you been doing? I, love, I don't have a number, but I love when people ask that. It's, I, I, don't, I don't keep track. I, the way I see it is I don't um, – if the dog is out there – and the family is working with me, it's either that it usually is trapped or the dog won't come back home alive. 
but it's rarely that the dog is out there but found somewhere else. But, but you must have an idea. I mean, how many dogs have how, what? How many dogs have you actually found in the course of? I'm assuming your career is in excess of, of five years. Is that is that fair? Not enough? even. No, no. I I'd say I did, I did four years of volunteering, and I did about now three, almost four years of this. Okay. So within three years, I think I probably have close to twenty finds. Twenty five. That's a lot. But it's not really. I mean, if you really look at it, it's, it's a lot for it, The reason why it's not higher is because I don't get as many cases as a lot of the other trappers. And, and the reason for that is because I am not a non for profit. Um, I charge people, but I don't make very much money doing it. But but because I charge, there's a real stigma and people don't like it. And rescue groups will. I've had a lot of people come in and step all over something I'm doing or give me a bad reputation or make stuff up or do anything to get me off the case because they don't like what I'm doing. And it's happened. And, and there's a really good trapper out there, too. Um, there's a couple of good trappers out there that have records that are ridiculous. They'll get like a dog a week, two dogs a week. Really? That, that's because they're getting seven requests a day. Um, but when people find out that you make money doing it, and what's ironic is the people from the nonprofits, they get donations and they have a salary that goes right into that. It's just wording it differently. But once I say that I'm, I'm charging you for tonight, um, it just doesn't go well. So is your, is your rate a flat fee or is it? Is no, it, it used to, it used to be, uh, it got to be hourly, but now it's completely different. Now it is a flat fee. Now I don't charge, I, I broke it down to the bare bones. And the idea that if, if people don't have the money to actually have their dog trapped, I started like a little, you can donate online and I, I'll hold money in a fund for a person. So, so I'm not paying my money out of my pocket to go out and save that dog. I don't like turning dogs down. Uh, I just don't like turning anyone away. But when you turn somebody away for money, I've never done that. If anything, I've, I've, I've gone cases where I've spent $700 to look for the dog and people weren't even paying me. But that's because I got emotionally attached to the animal. And to me, the way I see it is, I'm not going to turn a dog away and then know that that dog has nobody looking for it. I, I can't, I just, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. Is this your uh, sole profession? Is this what you do? Is this how yeah, you this do? is what I do. Yeah. But, but I do think it's, I don't think there's a long, I don't have, I don't know how much time I would have in the trapping world if I don't eventually go nonprofit. If I go nonprofit, I have a better chance of surviving. But, but right now it's, it's difficult because like I said, I'll get hired on a case, and then a day later they'll get rid of me because somebody who's free came on, well, and it just sucks. And but then there's a guy now who's like, I'm working with a company that's doing it all volunteer, and he's not happy because they're not staying up all night waiting at the trap like I am because you're paying me. Right. I'm doing it like dead focus. This is what I'm doing, and I think other people do it more on their time off. Yeah, but I, I was I was telling people like that's why I say it by your phone, right? Because the thing is, I mean, we leave a dog. Uh, you leave a trap, and the dog goes in the trap. Is there all night? Yeah, you, you can't. Yeah, I mean that dog was going to suffer, get killed. Well, but not only that, it's even if raccoons or cats or whatever gets in there, you have to get them out of there as soon as possible because if the dog sees them go in there, it won't go in the trap. You'll ruin the whole thing. So you got to be there to, and not to mention you don't have license. You don't have a license to to trap wildlife, and you're causing them distress, and possibly a smaller animal will, you know, could be. Uh, very vulnerable to, to predators, but uh, most of the time it's just raccoons that I got to go get out of my trap. We've talked a lot about missing dogs, so what about other types of pets? I mean, people lose birds, they lose snakes, they lose cats, they lose cats all the time. Yeah. So what's the oh, difference? Yeah, I do the same. No, it's the same with cats. I do, I've, I'll do readings for people with cats. I do a lot of readings for cats where people will call me and they'll, they'll be in another state and they'll say, oh, can, can you help me with my cat? But then after I'm done with all that, I'm like, then I want you to fill out my questionnaire. And then I want to show you all the things you can physically do. And let's think this through methodically and use my impressions to see if we have double of anything. You know, if we have any kind of possible chance of recovering our animal. You could use both. But I don't like to just give them my impressions and get out of there. I want, I want to talk to them about what happened. Because there was, there was a woman in Brooklyn not long ago that contacted me. And she said her cat had been missing for like nine days. And I asked her, I said, you know, Usually, if it's an outdoor cat and it doesn't come back, it was pushed out of its territory. There's, mm -hmm. there's a reason it happened. Or it stuck somewhere. So she started to walk around and ask about the boiler room. And her cat was alive in a boiler room, two houses down, and she got it back. 
but that's the kind of stuff that you got to think of it. Like you got to think, what are these cats doing or what are these animals doing? Or, What's the behavior? Why are they doing it? You know? And then, and then, you, and then on top of that, what are my impressions? <laughs> Here again, what, I, what I'm in, intrigued with is that we had talked about this early, but I think I'd like you to expand on it a little bit. When when you're looking for a lost pet, you're actually getting the message from the lost pet itself? No. Okay. I'm not communicating with a pet. I'm more or less seeing the pet as a third person. So I'm seeing, okay. it. I'm seeing information. All right. Sometimes I'll say, show me a landmark. Because I could also do remote viewing where you have the technique of remote viewing, which, you know, anyone can learn if you, if you take the course, you can do a remote viewing course. And that's separate. That's, but I find that I do more accurate stuff with impressions than I do with remote viewing. Um, it's just some people are better than others. But remote viewing can be very effective. But if I'm looking for a particular structure, I'll say, what am I looking at? What is all this stuff? And then I'll say, this feels like this. And that's actually what the, that half pipe was. I was doing a remote viewing session. In other words, I was, do you know the difference? I'm you don't know. when it comes to that. I, <laughs> it's okay. But it, remote viewing is a government, it, it, they used it in the 70s and 80s and 90s, and they still use it today, I'm sure. It's a secret government program called uh, Project Stargate. And they use psychics and teach them methods on how to systematically list words, colors, shapes, and they start to piece yeah. them together uh, and then they find locations. Now, I was saying there was a guy named Pat Price that died in 1977, I believe, or 76. He was the most accurate. And he helped find, like, nuclear weapons on Russia. They were spying on them. And Russia has the same program. So it's a way that people use. And I'm, I'm assuming there's a, a remote forensics. There's, there's, they, they have versions of this where they'll try and have these guys do the same t technique to find somebody if they're missing. or So... I used one of those techniques for this, and that's what came out was the half pipe. Um, yeah. Um, but when you when you go into, and maybe it's it's probably wrong to um, to characterize it as a session, but what is the procedure to actually start assessing where a lost pet is? Because it almost sounds like a, a, a Zen state. Do you have to? Oh, oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Um, is it possible if I could pause for a second and walk my dog down the, just outside? She's sure, just sure, no she's, st she's like pacing at the door, and I'm like, let well, me you, let me just get right back to you with that. So you you're being psychic with your dog, so that has. To well, she's gonna she's yeah. I don't want her to go on the floor. So, but how do I come back to this very moment? Do I leave, do I hit leave? Well, well, the thing is this, <laughs> we're already we're already over time. Yeah, we're over, so you know, so, so I'll tell you what, because you know you you are so fascinating. And I'm going to put Angel on the spot. I put you on the spot. Of course, I'm putting Angel on the spot. I want to, ha I want to have you back. Absolutely. Um, Whenever you want. Angel does all the, uh, you know, he's, he's the, the headmaster of the schedule. We got to do a lot of part twos. But, huh? We're lot of, we're gonna, we got to do a lot of part twos. Yeah, we can do part twos. Because, yeah. Because we're getting a lot of good people, and you're, you're awesome. Oh, yeah, thanks. I, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I always thought it would be cool to work on uh, lost animal cold cases and call it pause and order. But I think there's already. <laughs> I think uh, there's, yeah, okay. I've heard so, about that. <laughs> so we're all in, in, in agreement. Uh, we will we will let you go and take care of your dog. Just if you could just hang in there until we're able to uh, to, <clears throat> to to log off. Okay. And, uh, and you will definitely definitely be back. All right. Cool. All right. And Jill, so I'm going to leave the rest to you, bud. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Coming for oh, our show. We got to do a part two with you. Yeah. It's very interesting. Um, also, I know you're writing another a book, but we can't yep. talk about it because you're on the, on the writing on it. Yeah, yep. what we're talking about. And people, please uh, spay and neuter your pets. Do you know where your pets are? And listen, please subscribe to our show. Subscribe, like, notification. We have a lot more shows going on, um, a lot to do with your pets, and the best way to work with your pets. So please. Thanks, Jeff. We'll see you soon. All right. Thank you. Thanks for having me.